No, oh, thank you very much for that lovely introduction, and and uh, thank you very much for attending. It's a, a great pleasure to be here to present uh, the well, Walter Westman lecture. Uh, Yes, and it was good to hear the abstract that I submitted to, as well. I, I hope I can speak uh, relatively uh, sort of accurately uh, to what I promised to, to do. But what I will say, what I'd like to do with the presentation tonight is we're covering some pretty serious issues potentially uh, here in terms of the, the current state of environment and the challenges that face us collectively. Um, but I want to do it through the lens of a personal story in a way and actually tell the story of how I, even, I came to do the research that I, I, I am doing currently and, and the results that uh, we're, we're reaping now. Because they do tell, it, it, it is very closely intertwined with, with that story. So there's a lot of bad news uh, around in terms of environment and, and society and the challenges that confront us. So what I want to try and do is actually convey a message of hope uh, through you know, some of the research that we've been conducting, as well as raising some concerns. So it's worth understanding, uh, you know, in, in this era of you know, Trump and, 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 and uh, climate change and so on, why concepts such as truthiness have a hold in contemporary discourse. And it's not entirely you know, the fault of, of postmodernism, over, overstretch and so on. There are some, some genuine, uh, some reasons why uh, you know, these sorts of pathologies, if you like, have taken hold, and we want to try and unravel them and actually uh, present some of the potential solutions to those problems. So beginning with a personal story. So my own journey into this research uh, in environmental governance started with the idea that, re you know, it's a common idea as well, and, and, uh, and it still uh, has a pretty strong hold, is that we only value nature once we understand it, that it's a, a, a knowledge deficit, if you like. And it's taken quite a long time to realize that there's much more going on than that, 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 uh, that, that our value of nature is a very visceral, it's an, it's, it has a very strong emotional content. And that emotional dy dynamic can also be harnessed in ways that work against uh, harnessing environmental values as well, and I want to try and illuminate how that happens. And in fact, what really led me to the door in, in terms of this research, um, I began my academic career actually as a, as a, a potential scientist. Uh, I, I was a young North Queenslander who went on to uh, initially study marine biology. Uh, that didn't really work out, so I moved to geology and chemistry and, uh, and decided I wanted to be a professional cyclist and, uh, and then found myself actually very ill uh, for a number of years. And that gave me quite a bit of time to think uh, and reflect, and it was a very emotional experience as well. And it was that, the process of going through that uh, that, uh, that led me to, to, to develop an interest in environmental concerns, and ultimately into a, a degree in ecology, uh, in a part of environmental studies degree at Griffith University. And then, as realizing that the social sciences was important, having never studied in my life, moved a little bit into economics and policy, and suddenly I find myself in political theory. So it's actually a very multidisciplinary background that I have, uh, and it's been quite a journey. And now I find myself moving into the area of psychology and, and emotions, um, and, and uh, you'll see, uh, see where that has gone towards the end of the talk tonight. And I want to try and connect these narratives in ways that help understand where we are in relation to environmental issues and how we might harness them more productively. So science, knowledge, and learning, it, it's important, but it's not enough by itself. And if I, if I convey any message tonight, I hope it's that. It's something that interacts with what we feel and what we value. And that relationship, it can be complex, but it's potentially pr productive if properly harnessed. When I started researching this, as, a, as after recovering from my initial illness and going back to university, uh, I, I got interested in the, the history of thought in relation to environmental issues. And I actually, in preparation for this talk, dug up, dug up some of my, my honors uh, degree material and, uh, and, and had a bit of a look through. And it's a very interesting story that can, that, 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 that can be weaved together into a narrative in the relationship between scientific knowledge uh, and society and, and the role, potentially, of emotions here. So I was going to actually convey a little bit of that story to you. So I'm only talking about you know, sort of the history of science in, in the Western context here, of course, but the, the appreciation for na nature uh, and the wilderness, it's something that we commonly understand to be subsumed, subsumed after paganism um, via sort of various philosophical and religious constructs that held nature to be beneath contempt uh, in terms of humans. And, and in this case, we're obviously we're talking mostly about men, or entirely, in fact. 
And that's, that's expressed through various narratives in, in, in sort of Western history. The Platonic cave is a thought experiment which actually subsumed nature into higher thought. Early Christian thought, uh, which actually in, in turn, in fact, borrowed from a lot of Greco-Roman thought. The treated nature is tantamount to the corruption of man or humans. And the Garden of Eden is, is a story that conveys that as well. And these ideas, though, they need to be put in some sort of emotional context. And that makes sense when you actually look a little bit more deeply at the, the context of the time and the experience. So you know, we, we're talking about an era uh, in many respects where nature was actually a legitimately, genuinely dark and dangerous place in some respects. And, and you know, that context needs to be understood in terms of potentially why these sorts of ideas were developed. But as societies developed, it was arguably science and knowledge that was facilitated by Christianity that illuminated nature in part and opened the way for a renaissance. And part of that renaissance involved opening up not, not necessarily just the Bible, but also the book of nature um, and, and, uh, and engaging in a deep interpretation of that. And so scientific procedures began to emerge. And a very interesting you know, field to trace this development is that of forestry. So forestry began very much as a hard science and a very, very economics focused, of course, in terms of you know, concepts of sustained yield and, and sustainable growth and so on. But the science that developed from that ultimately gave way, in an indirect route anyway, to, to the ideas of landscape romanticism. And the, the most scientific expression of that, if anyone has heard of it, is, is Aldo Leopold's Ecological Aesthetique. It's perhaps one of the finest expressions of the relationship between science, observation, and, and emotions. The way that ecology, the landscape ecology, is understood is by looking at the landscape through the lens of an understanding of ecology. And that is something which is seen as actually intrinsically beautiful and, and it's worthy of inspiring poetry. So, you know, the relationship between emotions and, and, and ecology you know, really needs to be, can, can be really appreciated. It's very interesting. I mean, I, I actually feel a bit honored that I, you know, as part of my trajectory, I did study both ecology and actually economics, uh, as it turns out. And it's true, when you actually understand you know, the, the, the functioning of an ecosystem, it is something that's intrinsically beautiful. And, and economics is very interesting and, and complex, but for my money, ecology trumps it every time. Excuse me, using the term Trump. Yeah, so at a very personal level, the appreciation of nature is not to deny the human. It's the very expression of the best in humanity. And this, you know, the schism between nature and, 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 and the human is, is something I find very problematic. So it's taken me some time to realize this though. So before returning, you know, during my return to the studies after illness, you know, I developed a belief that you know, the understanding of nature was all that we needed. It was something that was driven by knowledge. And I put this into practice wherever I could as an undergraduate. I remember you know, developing a real passion for environmental issues to the point where I, uh, I took a job at one stage uh, with the Wilderness Society, and I don't know if they still do this. Uh, we used to dress up in a koala suit and walk around with a bucket and, and collect money. Uh, and I wasn't really keen on being in the koala suit because I actually liked to talk to people. You weren't allowed to talk in the koala suit. So I used to talk to, to people while we were actually here trying to raise money. Uh, and there was a lot of skepticism about environmental issues. And it used to be very interesting for me to talk to people about why it would be a good idea for them to donate money, even if, for example, they were in the field of forestry. And that was, very, that was very informative for me at that stage. So I collected a whole heap of experiences like this, and one of the more striking one, ones was in my 20s. I used to go, this is, I grew up in North Queensland, and, and this will become a bit more obvious as we go along. Um, and I was staying in Townsville, and I was on my way to my annual uh, hike along the coast of Hinchinbrook Island. And uh, my, my ferry left at six o'clock in the morning, and I missed my bus. So I, my only option I had left was to try and uh, go to the, the truck stop and, and get a, get a, a hitchhike uh, with, uh, with one of the truck drivers. And I managed to convince one, finally, to, to give me a lift. And off we went. It was about three o'clock in the morning at this stage. <laughs> and there's some, some, there maybe some, some parts of the story I won't convey uh, for public consumption at this stage, but it's it, fair to say it was a pretty interesting ride in what was probably a pretty illegal truck. Uh, and the driver, after warming up to me after a while, uh, encouraged me to look out for the police uh, in case uh, any, any, any came along and then he was likely to get a fine. But we managed to develop a bit of a camaraderie as we, 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 we drove along. But as we approached Cardwell, we 
we went past what was then a, a new development, a marina development, which was, uh, uh, this was the classic era of um, Queensland, the sort of the white shoe brigade, uh, you know, sort of you know, development focused and so on. And the, the, the conflict between environmentalists and, and development developers was, was acute, heavily acute at this stage. And this was reflected in public discourse. And this truck, truck driver was, pretty colorful in his language when he uh, talked about this particular development in terms of greenies. And, and, and the greenies was very much characterized as the other. And I was trying to think about what I was gonna do in that situation. You know, I was studying environmental sciences at the time. And you know, this, this was my moment, as it were, to actually speak up and say something. So I ended up telling him, uh, I, you know, I studied environmental sciences, and uh, I didn't really you know, subscribe to his point of view on this issue. And I got him to open up on it and talk about what was going on. And then we, you know, in the course of that conversation, we worked out that he liked fishing. That was something he was really passionate about. So I, I went through and I explained to him that you know, you know the mangroves are actually rookeries for fish. You know, if there's a direct relationship between your ability to catch fish and there being mangroves to, uh, to, uh, to breed them. And he thought about this for a bit. Um, and after, you know, we had about another 20 minutes conversation. By the time we got out of the truck, I'm not sure he was a converted greenie as such, but he was certainly a, a lot more, a lot less hostile to it. And he, in fact, he was slightly less disposed to the, to the idea of the development. So it felt like I opened his mind up a bit. So that was very instructive for me, those sorts of experiences, which indirectly led to me into the field that, I, that I, I'm in, away from natural sciences into the social. So I thought that these stories were exemplars of you know, triumph of reason over, over ignorance, if you like. But the story is more complicated, and the role of context and identity and emotions needs to be understood in this, this context as well. And these dimensions come into play in our contemporary era, with, you know, when we think about science and the relationship with knowledge and, and action in terms of, of, of uh, environmental issues. So the relationship between science in this respect seems to have been inverted in the, in, the, in the present era. Science has in part been transformed from the vanguard of progress to the bearer of bad environmental news. And now, you now this news occurs on a global scale, of course. We understand you know, the global, global phenomenon, environmental phenomenon, and, and the threats that they potentially pose. The collective efforts of habitat loss, yeah, global pollution and climate change, they're taking place on such a scale that we now begin to talk about uh, geological scale change under the rubric of the term Anthropocene, if, if I'm, I'm sure we've all heard of that. That we now have a geological era that is defined by the activities of humans. So it's a story that's difficult to square with you know, triumphalism in, in terms of human progress and science in, in some respects. So the, challenge, the, the, the question is how to respond to this challenge, and there's a number of ways that we can do that. One aspect of the, the, the discourse around how to, to act in the face of these sorts of challenges that really troubles me incredibly is the idea that democracy has failed. And to address these sorts of concerns, the, the approach that we, we need to take is to, if not um, uh, yeah, shut down democracy, but at least, at least, um, yeah, at least suspend some of its features uh, in the interim. Concern about the effects of the, the, the of humanity uh, on humanity of the anthrop of the anthropocenic impacts have led to re sorry excuse me have led some to reassert old age arguments that democracy simply isn't up to the task. The interesting thing about this and the unfortunate thing is it is a case of be careful what you wish for. If we look closely at, uh, at uh, contemporary events, it, we are, if, it, if, if we really want to observe, witnessing the erosion of certain democratic institutions. Uh, and of course, this can be most dramatically witnessed in, in the case of the, the USA at the moment. Now, of course, there are, there are, there are buffers and there are, there are processes that can actually mitigate these, these sorts of, of, of dynamics, but you know, there, there, there is some cause for concern there, potentially. So in the case of the response to scientific bad news, with these sorts of developments has been to kill the messenger, particularly in respect to climate change. And we see this in, in some respects in Australia, if, if, if less dramatically. So it might be easy to argue, however, that these, are, these developments involve a lack of cognition, stupidity, if you like, or willful ignorance. But it doesn't quite work 
to, to, to characterize them that way. Smart people are very capable of diluting themselves, and in fact, they're actually even bit more capable of diluting themselves, and they do it in much more sophisticated ways. Really what we need to do is recognize there's a whole range of human processes, very human processes that drive us to behave the way we do in respect to environmental uh, issues. And then we're not simply rational calculators uh, as humans, despite uh, what economics might teach us. We, you know, we, we, and, and I would argue that we as humans are intrinsically tied to our environmental circumstances. Well, I mean, that should be, to me, that's manifestly obvious. So this is the story that I want to tell you. Uh, it's been a long run up to the wicket, um, but uh, what I want to do is actually go through and demonstrate that there are democratic possibilities uh, that, that ultimately restore, restore not only democratic, but environmental concerns to their rightful place in Australia and globally. So I'll begin the story with the opening gambit, that when it comes to the question of environment democracy, the, so the solution to any challenge is that of more democracy. But the type of democracy that I'm going to advocate is what uh, we in our field refer to as, as deliberate democracy. And I'll, I'll try and explain that very quickly, what, what that involves. Specifically, yeah, ideally involves creating conditions that are conducive to good quality political deliberation. And, and in turn, as I hope to demonstrate, that they're conducive to good environmental outcomes in ways that connect what we might understand reasonably and feel emotionally as humans. I'm going to tell the story mainly via two case studies, uh, and there's going to be a lot of imagery uh, as we go through, and I'll try and, and not go through that too quickly, because I realize I've already taken up a fair bit of time in my talk just in the introduction. <laughs> so very quickly, deliberative democracy. Uh, this is a term that's actually, um, you, we're hearing it more and more in the public sphere, and unfortunately as a deliberative democrat, the way it tends to get characterized doesn't really reflect what we might understand as deliberative democracy. Uh, there's a tendency to refer to what we might call mini-publics, a sort of selection of members of the public uh, to you know, sort of discuss, uh, to, to confer on an issue, and I'll have two case studies of that as, as, as deliberate democracy. But really, when we talk about deliberate democracy, we talk about a whole system of governance, an ideal, a democratic ideal, and it's characterized by you know, ways that organize democratic institutions that exhibit the features of what we would call deliberativeness, and I'll explain that a little bit in a little bit more detail in a second. Inclusiveness and consequentiality. So the process of political discussion should be characterized by deliberation. It should include all citizens that are potentially affected by a decision, and that's hard to achieve in practice, of course. And those, the, the deliberative efforts of those citizens should actually have some bearing, some consequences in terms of potentially the decision. Now, it's been criticized as a very you know, sort of highfalutin ideal, but I want to try and give you a little bit of insight in, in, into possibilities and practicalities of how, how it might actually proceed. Another way you could characterize deliberate democracy is in very simple terms. In fact, I, I put it even simpler than what I, I, I've characterized there in, in, in the, the, the bullet point. Uh, very simply, it's, it's governance, uh, it's, it's deciding what to do in light of reasons, if you like. Okay, so we actually think, we really think about what should be done. We try and engage with all the different arguments and all the different values and all the different emotions as well. So when we in deliberate Democrats talk about deliberation as a process when citizens are actually working out, or parliamentarians indeed are working out uh, what the best course of action in, in relation to any particular issue is, they characterize a whole, rest, a whole menu of ideals, if you like, and I'm not gonna even go through these, but you know, in very crude terms, they engage with being open to ideas and really taking seriously the opinions, values, uh, and interests of others as a, as a part of collective reasoning. So the part that I'm interested in, in terms of deliberate democracy, is the reasoning part. And this is where my research starts to come into play. And the way that I think about reasoning is a little bit different to you know, sort of a logical, you know, sort of A therefore B approach. When we actually study this empirically, we actually look at how, you know, how individuals, and citizens if you like, see the world in very complex terms. There's a very complex place and make sense of that. So you know, this is the world if you like, and we have a whole series of intersecting arguments that as a citizen, we have to try and make sense of. The way we tend to do that, empirically, and it makes sense that we do, is we, 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 
we contain parts of the world. We have a coherent map, if you like. Yeah, we can call them. We call them discourses. You can call them perspectives. You can call them frames. There's a whole whole series of terms that you can call them. But there's actually a whole coherent set of beliefs and values that we tend to use as a reference point when we think about issues. And the research that I do looks at the relationship between how we see the world and how we decide what we should do. Process of reasoning. Now, reasoning, you should think of in one direction, but there's actually a flow in both senses. We actually update our map of the world in light of what we see and what we do as well. So the ideal is, is that what we choose is really directly responsive to how we see the world, but that's not always the case. So now I've moved you know, from ecology, where have I gone? I've gone, gone from natural sciences to social and, and moving more into the field of psychology. What's become really obvious is there's a whole library of pathologies that potentially subvert that process of reasoning. There's a whole series of reasons why, or reasons, processes that mean that we're not necessarily thinking through what even might be in our own interests potentially. And there's, you know, it's not the again because we're stupid. It's it's because the world's a complex place. And we have to make sense of it. And we engage in, in a whole series of things. One of which is we we understand in terms of motivated reasoning. Motivated reasoning really, yeah, in, in many respects, is a function of the fact that the world is a complex place. We've decided how we see the world. We have an investment in that. There is an emotional investment in that. So we defend that. So rather when we have, we, we're confronted with new evidence, we actually sel we select that evidence and argue in a way that supports our pre-existing view. Now we, see, uh, we see quite a lot of that. And it seems to be, uh, uh, well, I would argue it's becoming more common, but it, it's definitely uh, a bit more obvious in some respects in public discourse. So as well as internal sort of pathologies of reasoning, we have sort of group pathologies, if you like, where the way we actually look at an issue isn't necessarily a function of the issue itself, isn't directly related to, say, the environment. It can be the way we identify ourselves as a member of a group, or uh, there's a whole, a whole series of ways that we can actually you know, sort of cut, our, cut our identity, if you like. And in the case of the truck driver, his identity was, well, it certainly wasn't Greeny, it was the other. And this can actually drive the way we think about issues. But it doesn't necessarily reflect how we would really feel if we had a chance to, to you know, withdraw ourselves from that particular identity. We see this in politics all the time, uh, you know, in terms of our identities being driven by you know, the particular party of our affiliation. Now, you know, I'm not going to argue against uh, political parties per se, but it is problematic if the way we actually motivate our decisions is purely on the basis of, of identity. There's something which is intrinsically not quite rational about that in, 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 in the classic term. Another pathology is, is what's become known as the value action gap. So when you actually run classic surveys on environmental issues, it's very, very rare that you get anyone that says, I hate the environment. Everyone's an environmentalist. Everyone is concerned about potential environmental damage. But the way they operationalize that varies a lot. So value action gap explains a, a situation where you, you, you express a concern for environmental values, but the way you vote, the way you act, does not actually reflect that value, the expression of that value. I had a classic experience when I was doing field work uh, in Western Australia some years ago, where I met some people through, through friends in a bar, and explained to them I was doing research in, in, in sort of you know, sociology and climate change, and they began to express to me their deep concern about this issue in, you know, in very vehement terms uh, and thought it was fantastic that I was doing this research and they really, you know, they're worried about the future, as many people do. We then sat down to dinner and they began to show me pictures of their, the Porsche that they race, their private plane, uh, and, and demonstrate a lifestyle which was actually a little bit inconsistent. <laughs> but we all do this. I mean, I research in environmental uh, well, deliberate democracy, but also uh, environmental sociology and climate change, and yet I fly to Sweden two or three times a year because I have a research post there and a partner in that part of the world. We all do this to some extent. It's, it's, it's more common than we like to, like to think. Another pathology which, in fact this is my own term, is values inferred reasoning. I and mean, what I mean by this is there seems to be assumption that the, 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 the scientific concern implies action automatically without any reference to values. And climate change is a good example of this. It doesn't quite do to say that we have to do something about climate change because it exists. 
it's something that we have to feel as people, as, as, as citizens, as humans, that, that, that it demands action. To take us out of the equation, it, 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 it's not only not democratic, it, it actually denies the, the whole process of reasoning around this. We, we could actually be built in such a way as we don't care about future generations. Uh, and you know, we, we, we believe that we should just live for today. It turns out that uh, that's not really the case. Um, and where things go wrong tends not to be you know, with, the, with the influence of values per se. And another pathology that I will speak to directly in a second is, is something that we call symbolic politics. Symbolic politics is less a personal pathology, it's more of a political one. It's actually the fact that it's easier to, 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 to mobilize action on certain types of issues that are very emotional in their content. And immigration, of course, is the classic one. Uh, it's very easy to actually demonize the other, and again, that's a, that's a group-based phenomenon, and, and motivate, uh, motivate uh, a, a political response. So politics can be driven by a very narrow set of issues that don't reflect what really our overall concerns about an issue are. And I want to tell you, uh, uh, demonstrate this through the case study of my very first citizen's jury, uh, uh, citizen's jury being a sort of a, a, an ideal example of a deliberative process where we get members of the public to discuss an issue. And this was in far north Queensland in 2000 during my PhD. It, it, it seems like yesterday still, and I hope it's still a contemporary uh, case study. So I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the, with the, 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 the Daintree rainforest area. Uh, it's, it's now World Heritage listed, but at the time when the Bloomfield Track was built, it was unlisted and actually very much under threat. This was, uh, the road itself was actually constructed in the mid 1980s, uh, just as the, uh, the whole government was, was elected uh, federally. And it was actually built by the Queensland government, notionally to provide access to a remote community uh, in the northern area of the Daintree. Uh, and, uh, and according to public discourse to, uh, to weed out all the, the greeny drug growers up in the, in the region as well, the, the, the discourse around this was very much of this sort of vein. But the reality w was, was this was an attempt to ward off a federal intervention, interventionist federal government and actually soften the site to, to hold back the listing of World Heritage uh, in the area. Well, ultimately it didn't succeed, but the road is, is still there. There's a couple of features that are worth mentioning about the road itself. So the Bloomfield track between Cape Tribulation and Bloomfield, at the top of this is, is a town, uh, an area called the Bloomfield, which has um, a very underprivileged Aboriginal community, uh, which is, is, is quite isolated. And you know, the argument was that this is a human rights issue as much as, as, as a developmentalist one to actually provide them some access. The other thing that's notable about this area is that it's very hard to get to. Um, it's, it, it's restricted by a, a ferry crossing at the Daintree River. But once you get across the Daintree and you enter the, the rainforest area, you don't really see it now, but most of the area between the Daintree and Cape Tribulation itself is actually subdivided. But it's not cleared yet. And the reason why it's not cleared is because there's not many services. And the reason why there's not many services is because it's hard to get to. So there's a potential there for this whole area to be cleared. And the thing that holds it back is the fact that there is not a, lot, a good deal of road access. So building a road in this sort of area has potential implications. And while this road was built in, in the mid-1980s, it was still a very controversial issue when we went up there and, and conducted our research in 2000. So here's a picture of the area at the beginning of the road, Cape Tribulation itself. And the thing that's notable about this picture and, and this area is that we have a situation where there's rainforest which is very particular rainforest. I mean, the rainforest assemblage predates you know, eucalyptus trees. It actually, it's a rainforest that covered the entire Australian continent in the area when it was actually part of the Gondwana supercontinent. And as Australia split away from the rest of Gondwana and actually moved, and it was moved north, yes, uh, during the you know, geological era, the rainforest itself retreated and now only takes up a very, very narrow range along the coast. And this particular area is important because it's an area where you have rainforest in the mountains, going down to rainforest on the coast, and down to onshore reefs. It's, it's supposed to be the only place in the world where they call, uh, you have a situation where you, you have this whole assemblage here. The thing that you also know about, notice about this photo is that there's already a fair bit of clearing that's been going on here. 
Now, this picture isn't from the, the Dane Tree itself. It's actually from Mossman, where I grew, where I grew up. Um, and I, I put it in mainly because I like it. Uh, it's also where I used to do my swimming training when I was uh, doing triathlons at school. We didn't have a pool, and I used to actually tr swim between these two rocks uh, over in the picture there. But it's, it's sort of a, it's a very uh, you know, common, it's, 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 a, it's a nice visual illustration of the sort of beauty that you, you get in this particular region. Okay, so in the, in the era when the road was actually built, uh, Queensland was, yeah, I mean, half tongue in cheek, to characterize it as, as a kind of emerging democracy dominated by a rural elite. You know, there's a very strong environment development tension, and the road was very, very controversial at the time. We had very, very strong you know, emotive discourses about why this road should or should not be built. They were dominated on one hand by the fact that we, we needed this to uh, provide access to an isolated community. And on the other hand, the, the, the forces against the road not only talked about the direct damage, they emphasized the fact that this road was going to lead to sediment runoff, which was going to kill the onshore reefs. And this was going to be a very, very destructive thing. And it was very controversial. So you know, these are some images from the protests at the time that, uh, that went on for some months. And the government was so keen to build this road before the federal government had a chance to list it as World Heritage and therefore lose sovereignty effectively, that when there was a protest built buried into the road reserve, they actually went around them with the bulldozers and, and went off the road reserve and, and up the hill. And so the road's actually a little bit, it's kind of crazy to drive now as, as a function of, of these sorts of decisions at the time. And this is the road, uh, or part of it. This is one of the creek crossings. Uh, you have to go through quite a few crossings at the time. It's a very, very crude road, or it was at the time anyway. Uh, and I drove along it when I was 17 years old. I just got my license. And you know, it's etched into my memory where I actually gave way just for a vehicle coming the other way, and the whole side of the road gave way. And we went sliding down uh, and had to get uh, pulled out, out again. And this is a demonstration of how unstable the road is. It's, a, it's a, a very poor metamorphic soil in an area where rainfall is measured in meters. There's a lot of runoff. It's a very expensive road to maintain, uh, and there's, there's a lot of, there were a lot of concerns at the time about what to do with it. So as a research exercise, you know, in marched a, a, a younger PhD student, um, and we conducted a, a four-day deliberative process uh, on the road where we actually had a field trip on day one and some briefing. We had two days of witness presentations, and then we had a, day, uh, a final day of deliberation and report preparation to decide what to do. And what we tended to do is actually, when we do research on this, is we divide this into two phases, the information phase and the deliberation phase. But what I've realized since is that one of the most important parts of this process is the very first part of the phase where we actually develop the group. We get the group to be comfortable with each other and to be ready to actually think about the issue. So when we look at this empirically, what happened, you know, in terms of the, the discourses in relation to this, we get four. The first one, preservation, is the ideal kind of discourse. I mean, it's, it's already 22, so I guess I've only got a few more minutes to talk, potentially. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to get through this pretty quickly, and I might have to race through the second case study. I'm sorry about this. So this is the ideal disc environmental discourse, if you like where there's a concern about the environment, there's a recognition that the road is going to actually lead to incremental damage uh, and more development, which will lead to more clearing, and that the region is under threat. And the, 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 the related decision was, was to close it. The second discourse, pragmatism, was pragmatic. They, they wanted to see more evidence, and you know, the road actually could be benef beneficial as far as we know. And there was a tendency to just leave it as it is, maintain it as it is right now until we know better. The fourth discourse, optimism, it was a classic Queensland discourse. You could almost hear Joe Bjorka Peterson being channeled through this discourse. It was like, you know, humans are good for the environment, win-win is a possible solution, and the road is important for access. And that was one of the, you know, the very dominant uh, arguments at the time in politics. And the, 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 the decision associated with that was to bitumenize it. The last discourse, symbolism, was dominated by the, by the proposition the road's important for access, but also the proposition that the road is damaging to the reef. It was the classic uh, discord, uh, classic argument by environmental concerns at the time. And the conclusion associated with that was that, well, we have these, these two competing arguments. The only way we can actually reconcile them is to upgrade the road to reduce sediment runoff, but also provide road access. So into the fray uh, came, it's a very small process. We only had 12 people here, but it's, it was really worthwhile in terms of getting to know their positions in, you know, very, very intimately in what they thought. 
We actually can locate them across this discourse map, and so the white dots might be a little bit hard to see. I'm sorry about that. Um, you can see most of the participants were, were located within the preservation discourse, but in the overlapping uh, discourses as well. And what was actually the case is, is that these other discourses, particularly symbolism, dominated their decision making. The politics was so powerful at the time that any environmental concern was washed out by these sorts of arguments. But during the process itself, we had movement. And the reason was is because the propositions that supported the dominant discourse in, in politics at the time just simply couldn't be sustained. So I'm being a bit dramatic here to so make sure we're all still awake. The, it was, so not only the proposition that the road was important for access wasn't really substantive, and, and the reason was because there was actually an inland road at, that was being bituminized at the time, but also the proposition that the, the, the road was damaging to the reef could not be supported by the evidence. It was not the you know, substantive environmental issue uh, around, around the road. The real issue was actually the potential knock-on effects in terms of you know, development as a, as a result of greater access. So as a, as a result of that, there was a movement towards these positions. One was to close the road and one was to, was to maintain it. There wasn't consensus and often there really shouldn't be. It's good to have some diversity there. But the important thing here was that the two groups understood each other's position. They could really talk to each other. When we look at the, the change in the policy preferences, if you like, the, 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 the opinions, we started with a, with a situation where you know, stabilized was the, the dominant outcome to a really strong movement towards closing. So we had a very different outcome, but the thing from my perspective, in terms of the research I do, that the important thing was that there was a, a, a better collective reasoning. And the way that we actually measure this is a little bit complicated, but I'll, I'll show you very quickly. It's simply based on the proposition that if we agree or disagree in terms of how we see the world, then ideally if we've listened to all the arguments, we should then correspondingly agree or disagree to the same level in terms of the decisions we make. So what I do is I mathematically, if you like, look at the distance between the positions in terms of how we see the world to see how that corresponds, how close we then are in terms of the decisions we make. And we put them on a graph, okay. So this is an you know, example of two, two individuals in relation to a, a third one. One is where there's a consistency in terms of their beliefs about the world and their choices, and the one where there's not a consistency. And in fact, that pattern was reflected in the pre-deliberative situation. We don't have consistency here, and the reason for that is that when we make political judgments, we're thinking about a very narrow range of considerations. One set of people are thinking about the access, another one is thinking about the reef, there's not a synthesis across those sorts of concerns. Politics in everyday sense doesn't usually work like that. But in the deliberative context, the relationship between these changed dramatically. There's like a collective reasoning that emerges from this, and that's because we're actually listening and reasoning across all the, all the relevant issues. And when we actually look at what this does, what happens in terms of you know, the, the discussion and so on, you start to get the sorts of ideals that we might talk about in deliberative democracy. So the real question here is, you know, how did this happen? How, what, were the, what were the conditions that actually, that actually uh, that, that, uh, created, created the situation? Well, actually, I'm going to get to that in a, in a little bit. What I'm going to do first is actually go to the second case study very quickly, uh, which was dealing with climate change uh, in the ACT and the Goulburn region. We actually have a Sydney case study which came up with very similar results, but. In this case, we, uh, we, we have some climate change scenarios that are worth showing to you as well. So this one actually shows how Canberra's climate is going to change overall in terms of temperature and rainfall. By 2050, and this is the high emission scenario, but this is actually a business as usual scenario, if you like. So the climate for Canberra in 2050 is gonna migrate from the north here, and then uh, Cobar, you can't quite see it there, actually, the actual town, it would, uh, would be the, uh, the sort of temperature range that Canberra experienced in 2100. We, do, we developed a whole series of scenarios, and I'm only going to show you a few of them here uh, very quickly. So this is the change in temperature, 2050, and then 2100. I meant to delete this, oh no, it's, it's okay. So this, for some reason or other, seems to be the one that had the impact on participants. This is actually where you can grow grapes. Uh, in, 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 this, in this region. So this is the baseline area where, where it's possible, at least climatically, to grow grapes. It doesn't take into account land use or, or soil or anything. By the time we get to 2050, 
and then 2100. And uh, yeah, we, we get quite a lot of response to this now. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but you know, it, it, it is a projection. There may be some problems with the modeling. Hopefully we'll, we'll avert this sort of scenario. But what we did is we had a, a series of about 20 slides. We showed them to 100 participants and we surveyed them in terms of their response. How do you feel about this? And as part of that, we actually we, we, we came, came up with four different discourses. Now, very, very quickly, the ones that are important here, we had sort of not deep skeptics in terms of assured skepticism, a little bit skeptical about the issue. Government, government imperative was really concerned about the issue but demanded that government do something about it. It wasn't really a collective responsibility. And then D was alarm defeatism, which is a discourse we've had in a number of case studies, is when climate changes at such a rate, rather than actually have a constructive response, if you like, we have to do something about this, there's a withdrawal. There is a form of depression if you like. It is a very emotional response. Uh, and uh, you know, we posited that this was a very maladaptive response potentially to climate change. And then we surveyed you know, individuals and we looked at their movement across the map and this is the sort of movement we got when we, when we showed them the high emission scenario. Okay, Demand for action and a little bit of movement into, in towards being a bit, a bit depressed about the issue. But when we surveyed them some months later, at the, end of the, at the end of this process, we actually explained that these were modeling scenarios who were predicting to some extent but the potential future. We had a very strong reaction to the scenarios, but in the follow-up, there was very little change overall. There was a movement back in most respects to the original positions. And participants said, you know, these, these are very dramatic scenarios, but when we go back to our everyday context, you know, we, we couldn't sustain the, the sort of response uh, anymore. The context was back to the everyday. So what we then did is we actually conducted a, a three-day deliberative process and looked at the responses there. I'm sorry, it's actually a little bit hard to see uh, the, the positions here. The, I was going to tell you a story about what happened to the skeptics, and I, I just don't have time. But the important story here is that deliberation then just changed positions. It also changed the whole story. It changed the map, if you like. The, the, the discourse around climate change is so problematic in the Australian context that the W process had to reconfigure the way we actually, very, we actually think about this, this issue. And I'm not going to get into the details. We're going to move along here. Okay. So we're getting close to the punchline here. The question is, why does deliberation work? Is it information and knowledge? Well, yes. I mean, it was an information-rich environment. Uh, that the participants were, 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 were involved in. But the most important thing here was the context and situation. These are uh, 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 citizens who actually took seriously the opportunity to work through issues and, 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 and engage in cognition and learning about scientific knowledge and, and come up with, with, a, with a solution. And this had very, very profound effects. And a big part of this was the fact that this was a group process. You know, they identified as a group, took this idea very seriously that they would actually work through this issue. And it occurred to me, you know, I've been doing this for about 20 years now, it occurred to me that one of the things that seems to really work here is that when you go through that early process and you develop the group and you develop what we might call a deliberative norm, you know, it seems to have a much more powerful deliberative effect than when you don't. So I decided to actually test this. So I grouped all the mini publics, the deliberative processes that I've analyzed into two groups. One where we actually had uh, worked with the group. We, we did something we call it meta deliberation. We said, okay, you're going to engage in a deliberative process. And usually politics, you know, we behave in a particular way. How do you think we should behave? And when the facilitator went through that process, lo and behold, the sort of recommendations they came up with are entirely consistent with what the deliberative theorists come up with in terms of how deliberation should be. There was something very intuitive about how that should work. And when they went through that, we actually observed that their behavior was more deliberative as well. So the context was really important here. So what I actually did is quantify the changes in group reasoning, if you like, for those processes where we didn't do this, and, and these are the results. The, the reasoning in, seem, improves in most cases, except one Italian case study, and that's another story uh, where it didn't. Where we did do this sort of group development, we actually get a, a, a quite a dramatic difference in terms of the impact of that. The emotional context, if you like, the group context, changed the way that participants engaged in cognition in this, in this, in this sense. And another thing that I've done is, you know, 
I won't get into the mathematics here or the actual detailed results, is actually look at other facet, aspects of, of the context. And group development is not only important, but when we actually look at processes that involve some sort of vote, it seems that voting is actually one of the worst things you can engage in in terms of achieving deliberation. Now, this is very consistent with a good deal of literature that's emerging around this. And it actually is pretty consistent with what we're observing in, in relation to the, you know, the, the post-war vote, if you like, in relation to um, marriage equality. It's not, you know, and this isn't to actually take a particular side in this, is that the conversation seems to be, it, it seems to be harder to have a deliberative engagement on this issue when there's a vote. We, we behave strategically, as we would call, rather than communicatively. And this is actually some more research that we have to do. We don't have really have time to get into this. What I want to try and do here is actually demonstrate to you that the process of deliberation isn't smooth. Once you actually open up minds, you don't automatically become reasonable, if you like, in a group sense. It actually takes a little bit of time to work into. Okay, so without, we'll just get through the slide here. The model really is something like this. And we think about this in terms of the truck driver that I, I was, I was uh, talking to when I was in, in my 20s. Now we have a situation where we're pretty happy with how we see the world and we want to, you know, it, it takes some incentive to actually get over this hump if you like. And deliberation is a process of actually opening up minds, which takes a bit of energy if you like. This is sort of like a, a, an energy in terms of opening up, the di opening up the possibility of dissonance where we are a little bit stressed about having to think about issues that we thought we'd settled before. But ideally the delivery process gets us over the hump and we actually reach a, a new equi equilibrium. We've actually thought through the issue more. And when we actually survey people who have engaged in delivery processes, almost universally they, they express incredible satisfaction. There's something very pleasurable, pleasurable having got over this hump and thought about the issue and, and, and then worked through it. This is the second last slide. I'm, I'm very, very nearly there. I want to I wanna finish off here with some research that we've done in Sweden where we've tested not only the possibility of going through group processes, we've actually used some of the developments in, uh, in, in, in clinical psychology where they use mindfulness training. Uh, and what we wanted to do was actually test the effects of mindfulness in achieving de deliberative outcomes and it was really, really interesting. Uh, I wanted to try and demonstrate that it's not just a bunch of, you know, it's, it's not just sort of this esoteric uh, sort of idea. So what we did is we actually surveyed before and after the same period, uh, this, was a, this wasn't an environmental issue, this was something on immigration and begging in the streets of, of Uppsala, it's a, it's a fascinating case study, where when you survey before and after without any sort of treatment, you actually get some pretty dramatic changes. Um, still, you know, we, there's some random, random changes and we see this in, in polling a lot. Um, I'm not going to get into a discussion about the graphs at this stage, I just want you to focus on, the, on actually the, the scatter plot at the top here. The second treatment involved just deliberation. We actually just assembled participants to, to deliberate. And in this case, we actually did get an improvement in reasoning and we got some change, we actually got a smaller, smaller absolute change, but the reasoning improved, whereas the no, no deliberation didn't. But when, with, the, with, with effectively the same process, we took a subgroup and before each process, we engaged in, in uh, some mindfulness techniques, which have been used in therapy, which really were just a way of actually getting, in, getting participants to actually to think about why they think they feel the way they do about an issue, to actually really open up their thinking. And lo and behold, we got a much more dramatic improvement in group reasoning, reasoning for that, for, uh, as, as a result of that process. So where does all this leave us? I'm sorry, I've almost taken up my complete allotted hour. Uh, maybe we'll have a couple of questions at the end. Uh, I, I just want to sort of posit a few thoughts about the, the possibilities that these sorts of results and this sort of thinking opens up. My first assertion would be that appreciation for the environment is as much revealed as it is constructed. This is the value action gap that I'm talking about, that, that actually can, creating a deliberative context created a, 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 an environment in which that could be expressed. It linked our inherent concern for environmental issues with our actions in terms of you know, decisions. The second one is that deliberative political cognition is, is an inherently intersubjective, uh, it's a community process. And we think about you know, reasoning as something as, as individual, and it is, of course, but it is, is in, a, in an intersubjective, it's, it's a group context where deliberation really took off. It's, 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 it was the context of the group that really counted here. 
The next one is that these deliberative processes, they, they don't just change opinions and become more, more environmental, they actually reconnect what we think about the world and the decisions we make. And I've made the argument in a number of avenues that is, it has an emancipatory effect. It actually it helps us realize as individuals what really is in our own best interests, and that applies hopefully to myself as well. And then the governing and the age of the anthrop Anthropocene demands uh, you know, in light of some of these findings, a deepening of the democratic process along the deliberative lines. And that, finally, the process of doing so demands that we take seriously how we are as humans, the emotions, uh, and, and how they interact with knowledge in the political context. And I hope, even though I haven't been able to talk about the broader implications of this uh, for lack of time, that uh, there's some realization about those sort of possibilities as, as a result of these findings. So uh, there I'll leave it, and I'll thank you very much.